Okay, so um, this map here shows uh, Russian uh, Russian expansion um, of the seas, so or of of Russia. So when we think about um, really a lot of the transformation that takes place within empires, uh, we really look at Western Europe, and that's kind of the way that we do things. Our Westernized world, <coughs> excuse me, of of Russia. So we look at this. So now we look at here and we see Moscow in purple. And then we start to see date by date how Russia expands. So it's not just Western European countries going out into other places and expanding their empires. Other groups are doing this as well. And Russia is one of them. All right. So we can see Moscow is really the center point of this here. But then we look into uh, 1462 to 1533. We're talking about the green area where Russia expands and then even further until 1598 and then even further okay, as we go into the expansion into Siberia. And we're going to talk quite a bit about why this happens um, in this, but this is really kind of the, the, the cause point of what we're looking at here, this map. So Russia and their expansion, it's really a small state at first that's really centered right around Russia. But so the Russian empire though, is going to take shape while Western Europeans are kind of building their empires as well. How does it start? It starts with Moscow uh, and emerges from that, from the Mongol rule. And so Russia's power begins to grow right around 1480. Russia starts conquering neighboring cities all throughout uh, their countries. And over three year or three centuries, excuse me, 300 years, they begin to grow into this massive empire. And we can see that massive empire that exists on that map. Um, they have early expansion into the grasslands that are south and east. That is really against security for uh, against groups like the nomads, uh, people who were like the Mongol people, but not necessarily the Mongols themselves. And then we have an expansion into Siberia. Um, that was really a matter of opportunity. Siberia itself is not a land that you go in and you are like, wow, this is amazing land here. It's, it's more for the furs that existed. And so what was the, the, the period that we called that was caused with a lot of death was what we had known as the Little Ice Age, correct? We talked about that earlier in this chapter. And the Little Ice Age is something that existed. And so people are looking for what they called this soft gold, right? Which was really furs um, and, uh, and, and like beaver pelts. Uh, uh, and Russia even does this in the Americas as well. Uh, and so too do the French. But during the Little Ice Age, people were looking for anything to keep them warm. And this was something that was part of it. So that expansion into Siberia was a huge part of this. Um, it was opportunity for them um, to go and hunt these animals and bring them back and make money off of it. It wasn't necessarily for threat purposes whatsoever. So as we start to see this, we start moving ourselves forward into uh, this. The empire was uh, building was extended process though. Um, the Russian state and all the officials there uh, had very much private interests. Uh, merchants, hunters, peasants, churchmen, all of these different groups uh, were going out into these areas and pushing out their own ideals. So um, experiencing the Russian empire itself, uh, what are the factors of conquest? Conquest is really going to be made possible by the modern weapons um, and organization capacity of the states. It brings the steppe lands Okay, and Siberia all under Russian control. And so everywhere the Russian authorities uh, would go and conquer, they would demand some type of oath of allegiance um, in which they would uh, claim their allegiance to the czar himself. Um, generally speaking, they demanded a yasek or a tribute that would be paid in cash uh, or in something of that kind. And uh, over time, the conquest brings about some devastating uh, epidemics okay, with, with the conquest. So the, when we look at the effects of the conquest, we're talking about um, really the epidemics that take place in the remote areas of Siberia being a part of that. 
in which locals, kind of like when we see the Americas, the locals have really no immunity towards uh, those epidemics. So like smallpox and measles, things that were westernized kind of ideals, uh, but not necessarily, they, they weren't necessarily immune to it. Um, we start to see the pressure to convert to Christianity. Um, tax breaks and exemptions from paying tribute and the promise of land uh, land grants for our, our incentives, okay, for those groups to convert to Christianity. So if you were going to actually go through and, and start your conversion, okay, you would start to see uh, that you would be uh, better off in terms of money-wise things. You would also see destructions of things like mosques, um, the forced resettlement of Muslims in there as well that would add to those scales. Um, the Russian state does not necessarily pursue the single-minded uh, intensity that the Spanish did though in Latin America. So the difference is that uh, you're looking at uh, missionaries uh, actively threatening political and social stability. That wasn't the case um, in Russia. The, uh, the empress who was, uh, we know her as Catherine the Great, um, she established religious tolerance for Muslims in the late 18th century and then created a state agency to oversee different affairs of the Muslim people there. So that was something of that nature. Um, also, we see large scale settlement of the Russian settlers um, in the new lands where they would outnumber the... Uh, um, they would outnumber the uh, native population. Um, so Russian settlers whose numbers uh, is going to overwhelm those native peoples, uh, by 1720, 700,000 Russians are going to live in Siberia. And it reduces the native Siberians to 30% of that total population. Um, and it drops again from 14 to 14% in the 19th century. So they lose things like hunting grounds, um, uh, pasture lands, it really goes against the idea of pastoralists. They encourage the pastoralists to move away from uh, no, nomadic ways um, and pay fees to uh, get permission to cross agricultural lands. So therefore we start to see that being, uh, being a big part of this as well. And sorry, let me go back to this. And then um, lastly, guys, uh, the many uh, natives will be what are called what's called Russified. All right. Um, they're going to be incorporated into the Russian state, adopting the Russian language, converting to Christianity, uh, even as their traditional ways of life, which was hunting and herding at that time, were disrupted. So the Russian Empire represents kind of the final triumph of the agrarian civilization uh, within human societies or hunting societies in Russia there. Um, this here is De, uh, it's a De Augustini uh, picture uh, in the uh, Russian expansion across Siberia. A group of people known as the Cossacks, okay, bands of fiercely independent warriors that um, consisted of peasants uh, who would have escaped serfdom, um, as well as other groups, criminals and such. Uh, and there you see the 16th century Cossack war Yermak shown uh, leading his troops through Siberia. Okay. So now expansion into uh, uh, the Russians and the Russian Empire. And so when we look at this, ex imperial expansion becomes a big part of this ideal. Um, the empire transforms the conquered people. It also fundamentally changes Russia itself. They become a smaller proportion of the overall population, but they're actually politically dominant in this ideal. Um, when we look at, uh, when we look at this, they, uh, among the growing number of non-Russians within the empire, you have Slavic speaking Ukrainians, um, Belarusians uh, predominated. Uh, you have other territories of Siberia that have steppes uh, housed numerous separate uh, peoples that existed throughout this time. The Slavic thing that we see uh, is going to date us even further. It's going to push us even further into history 
when we look at World War I, um, that becomes a part of World War I, the Slavic speaking people and the groups that Russia held with them. <clears throat> so over time, we start to see that as well. There is uh, rich agricultural land as well that's a part of this, furs, minerals that helped make Russia really a great power by the 18th century. Um, unlike the expansion to the east, their westward movement occurs in context of military rivalries, however. Um, we don't necessarily see this group of people become a part of that. So the Ottoman Empire, Poland, Sweden, Lithuania, Prussia, those groups there. Uh, you see um, Russia acquiring substantial territories in the Baltic region, okay? Baltic being down by uh, the Baltic Sea at the lower end of near Greece, that area there. That is going to uh, lead into another part of World War I as well. We'll talk more about that when we get to that point. Um, so the contact with Europe is going to foster an awareness of Russia's kind of backwardness, okay, that's relative to Europe and kind of uh, extensive program of westernization. Um, Peter the Great is going to be one of those leaders within that. Peter the Great is the one leader within Russia that is going to ex definitely give them some westernized ideas. He actually goes into westernized countries like Germany, like uh, France. Um, he takes trips there and he brings back efforts of an administrative change. He tries to change up the administrative views. Uh, he looks into religion being uh, brought under one roof. Um, and so all of these things are a part of this. He has his own groups who start to dress in Western clothes as opposed to the traditional Russian ideal clothing that they have. Um, Peter, one of Peter's successors is Catherine the Great follows up with further efforts to Europeanize Russian cultural and intellectual life. Um, she views herself as part of the European Enlightenment period uh, that had existed during this time as well. So with the European Enlightenment period that takes place, we'll talk a little bit more about the Enlightenment too, but she really pushes herself into that as well. Um, When we look at this, Russia really becomes a, uh, an, a, an Asian power as well as a European power because of where they are pushing themselves to. Um, Russia does have an identity crisis, however. Okay? The long-term identity crisis that they have is expansion makes Russia a very militarized state. And it really reinforces the autocracy, okay, uh, that they had. Um, so what is the point? Where do they go from here? Uh, was Russia kind of a backward European society or is it different? Is it uniquely kind of uh, Slavic or Asian, even Asian shaped by kind of the Mongol legacy um, and such? So that's a problem that, that needs to be answered. Um, is there a question uh, that Russians kind of have not completely answered in that 21st century? So that is another part of this. And then the colonization experience itself is very different from the Americas. Um, the conquest of the territories with which Russia had really long interacted with. So they'd already had some type of uh, state with them. And the conquest is also going to take place at the same time as the development of the Russian state. So they are developing their own country, whereas Britain had already had theirs developed for quite some time and then push out into the Americas. Spain had theirs developed long before and then push into the Americas, so on and so forth. Russia is developing their state as they are going through and conquering different lands. So that was the biggest part problem there. And then the Russian empire re will remain intact all the way up until 1991, all right? Any questions there, guys?